I'm Eric Marcus, and this is a special bonus episode of Making Gay History. Back in the late 1980s, over the two years that I interviewed people for my book, I found there were two emotions driving people to do what they did in the fight for equal rights. One was anger over discrimination and disrespect, and the other was love, the right to love and be loved for who we are. We're releasing this on Valentine's Day, but whenever you hear it, think of this as a love letter. We've reached back into my stack of audio cassettes to bring you some moments from a few very special love stories about cautious love, the loss of a love, love sickness, and first love. Nancy Walker had been burned before. She'd fallen head over heels for a woman who couldn't love her back. But then she met someone who melted her heart and she couldn't quite believe it. Interview with Nancy Walker, Sunday, December 10th, 1989, at the home of Nancy Walker in Jamaica Plains, Massachusetts. And then this one. She was too tall, and she was gawky. She was still a kid, and she had a dreadful haircut. And all her clothes were wrong. I was sure she had this man who was interested in her. And she used to write him these long letters by hand on yellow lined paper. And I used to, I remember looking at those and thinking, oh my God, she's going to get involved with him. And I better prepare myself because this is not going to work. But it did. It did. It really, she said, I love you. I said, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. This is not what your mother had in mind. And she kept looking at me and smiling, saying, I love you. And I said, oh, my God, how am I going to deal with this? When she said, I love you, I said, I don't believe it. It's puppy love. You'll get over it. When she was 25, she said, you still believe me? I said, I'll believe you when you're 30. And 27 years later. I wasn't sure that the bubble wasn't going to burst and that you weren't going to disappear on me because it was too good to be true. Uh. When Emery Hetrick died in 1987, the New York Times obituary described the love of his life, Damien Martin, as his companion of the last 12 years. To me, that sounds like they were talking about his cat. Damien and Emery founded an organization that was one of the first to support LGBTQ youth. It was originally called the Hetrick Martin Institute for the Protection of Lesbian and Gay Youth. Today, it's known as HMI. But if you'd ask Damien, he'd tell you that their greatest accomplishment was their love for each other. Emery was the um, first person in my life that uh, that I was able to trust completely, completely, no reservations. Emery really fulfilled my life. Uh, it ended too soon. It ended before I ended, which is bad. But at the same time, it's something that. Um, uh, I mean, gee, I sound like something out of Reader's Digest. Uh, it's, it's something nobody can take away from me. We've experienced. And Emery and I talked about this right before he died, that with everything, we were still so glad, so happy that we'd gotten together before we died. You know? and I used to tease him, because you know, we were both older when we met, that um, uh, you know, we just saved the best to last. That was all. People have said to me, well, you must have been relieved when his sufferings ended. And I wasn't. Uh-uh. I wasn't. <laughs> I, I, you know... Uh, they didn't know. They had no well, idea. No, I mean, I, um, I mean, toward the end, he was very sick, and I really had to take care of him. And uh, I feel privileged that I was there to do it. And it was, it was another level of our, our unity, if you will. All the worst times during his illness were not so bad as not having him. In season one, you heard legendary activists Kay LaHusen and Barbara Giddings talk about how they met and fell in love. But decades before that, Kay was a teenager with a secret that just about swept her away. The summer after I graduated from high school, I met a girl that I had been in high school with. Fell in love with her, she fell in love with me. 
I have to tell you, I just, I had a breakdown over it. Um, literally had to go to bed and lie down and I was totally weak and it was like a hammer was pounding my head. And this went on for two weeks and my uh, family, well viral pneumonia was big then. So they said, this is viral pneumonia. <laughs> And I remember my grandmother, I was actually raised by my grandparents, I remember my grandmother saying that I couldn't just lie there, I had to do something. I would either have to go to a doctor or I would have to have Christian science treatment. You have to recognize I was raised in a Christian science, partly, household. So I have always hated doctors, so I said, well, all right, I'll have a Christian science practitioner come and pray over this. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Of course, I wasn't about to tell her what I was agonizing over. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, I remember I finally brought it to a head within myself, and I just decided within myself that I was right and the world was wrong, and that there couldn't be anything wrong with this kind of love. That the world was just totally wrong about this, and I got well. <laughs> I mean, I, I had a quick healing. <laughs> Do you ever forget the first time you fell in love? That exhilarating terror mixed with breathless excitement? I remember, and it was the first time in my life that I felt normal. And like Morty Manford, I was 17 the first time it happened. Morty was a lawyer, a co-founder with his mom of PFLAG, and a fierce advocate in the fight for LGBTQ rights in 1970s New York. But before Morty became an activist, there was that certain summer of 1968. I used to go into Manhattan and walk and walk, hoping that somebody would come sweep me off my feet and make mad passionate love to me. <laughs> There were a lot of us wandering around Manhattan thinking that. Yes, well, it happened. Uh -huh. I was 17, he was already 18, and he was a beauty. And uh, started talking to me, and uh, he was very colorful, and uh, we, we were talking about the world, uh -huh. and... Uh, social issues, and uh, we must have spent six or eight hours that night just walking and talking and sitting down, and and he was working as a waiter in a restaurant in Manhattan. And, uh, then one evening I went to pick him up at work. He said uh, a few of us from the restaurant are going over to a bar down the block uh, so you hadn't have a drink. You hadn't discussed gay stuff and you hadn't messed around? No. We walk into this bar, it was called the Old Vic. It was all men in the bar, and they were all dancing together. I was just sort of standing there, uh, <laughs> amazed and, and uh, delighted and anxious, and, um, and then he turned to me and asked me to dance, a slow dance. And what did you say? I said, yes. Your greatest desire and uh, your greatest fear, all in one. I knew I wanted to dance with him, and we danced. Do you remember what the music was? I think it was uh, that song, Turn Around, Look at Me. There is someone standing behind you. Turn around, look at me. Yeah. <laughs> I can't sing, but a uh, good thing this is all in print. Uh, <laughs> it's a moment that stays with you. Uh, yes. And so you came back here. And the fireworks were in the sky that night. There is someone. I went to visit my immigrant grandmother just after she'd finished reading my book, including the stories of the people you've just heard. Grandma, who was in her early 90s, said, Now I understand. You just want what everybody else has. Someone special to love. 
Yes, Grandma, I said, someone special to love. And soon after, when I introduced Grandma to my new special love, she embraced him as a grandson. Thanks to everyone on the Making Gay History crew for this bonus episode, including our executive producer, Sarah Burningham, our co-producer, Jenna Weiss-Berman, and Barry Finkel from Pineapple Street Media. And thanks to the New York Public Library for archival assistance. A special thank you on this Valentine's Day to my special love of 23 years, who has been unwavering in his support and enthusiasm for the Making Gay History podcast from day one. I know I haven't always made it easy for you, but I love you more than anyone on earth. We'll be back next week with a taste of what's to come in season two. In the meantime, if you want to read more about what happened to the people whose stories you've just heard, head to makinggayhistory.com. And make sure you subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, NPR One, or wherever you get your podcasts. Happy Valentine's Day from all of us at Making Gay History. We're grateful for all the love notes you've sent to us, and we send you our love in return. (laughs) 